Let's see, uh, back in class, Jason, you're asking week number, uh, uh, I, I don't know is the answer, but I wouldn't worry about week numbers. It's better uh, for uh, to use week names, un unless you need that for the evaluation. I'm not, in that case, I'm not sure. And it sounds like there's a nice plan for a party with a mish, where you have your clothes folded while you get a massage, um, drink tea, eat a sausage and admire the patterns in the sand. Um, while a dinosaur uh, eats your finger. Uh, so first schedule, um, we're back to recitations. On the 17th, we're going to have a recitation on the FAB ecosystem. And so you'll hear from FAB Foundation, FAB Cities, FAB Portal, FAB Conferences, um, super Labs, uh, the All In, and oh, no, actually, All In uh, was going to fill in, but um, you're going to meet all of these organizations we've created to support the FAB network. And today is sensors, input devices. So I'm going to cover many different ways to get inputs in. Before the break, we did outputs out. So, individual, oh, let's see. Uh, I am recording. Um, uh, individual assignment is to measure something. So take a board you've designed and add a sensor. You can either design uh, a sensor that goes into an existing board, or you can make a new board. And then as a group, this is an experiment, an exercise in debugging. <clears throat> so I want you to use a scope to look at the analog signals uh, and a scope or logic analyzer to look at the digital signals. So this is all about the data sheets. So this is one of the processors in AVR. Uh, and we're going to look at a number of different peripherals uh, in it. So. Uh, within the AVR, there are first uh, ports, let's see, these are all, let's see, good. Uh, so ports are just pins that uh, re <clears throat> can read in logic levels. And as a reminder, uh, typically there's a pull-up resistor you can turn on to talk to buttons, which I'll talk about. Uh, so that's just a port. Uh, then after that, if we scroll for inputs, um, there are a number of other modules. See, for some reason, this has unfolded all of them. But the um, there's uh, TWI, which is the same as I squared C. This is a logical protocol that we use often to talk to uh, devices that speak digitally. And I'm going to show you examples of that. Uh, then if we, there's an analog comparator that compares just two signals and says one is above or below the other. That might not sound useful, but one virtue of it is it's very fast. It can do that in a single cycle. And another is there's many applications like checking a battery drooping where you just want to know an event happens where it goes below a threshold. So that's the comparator. Then the ADC <clears throat> takes an analog signal in and makes a digital output. And depending on the processor, it can be either single ended, a voltage, or the difference between two voltages. Um, you can typically control how fast you convert, trading that off against how many digits of resolution you get. And then in addition, many processors have amplifiers. This one in particular has particularly interesting ones. This processor has multiple amplifiers, and you can configure them in all different sort of uh, circuits. So this is, for example, what's called an instrumentation amplifier for low level signals. And so the amplifiers let you bring up uh, small signals and digitize them. So those are the kind of inputs we're going to be using. 
and I'm going to zip through lots of different examples. So to start, uh, this is a button uh, with a broken link. I'll fix that. And all that's happening here is I, I when I push it, it says down. When I raise it, it says up. Uh, this is a pretty uninteresting circuit. All I have is uh, one side of the button goes to ground, the other goes to a pin. And then remember, we have the pull-up resistor inside. So um, the button goes to ground, and then inside we have the pull-up resistor turned on. So it stays high and the button turns low. And then I've got a couple different versions. So this is with the Tiny 412. And here, this is using the Arduino library. So I say, I want the button to be an input, and I read the button. And then uh, this is using the um, uh, talking directly to the pins. So here, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm reading the pins. And pin test here is just a very simple macro I define that tests the pins. And then here, I'm actually talking to the hardware ports. So this is below the level of the Arduino library, which you can do more efficiently. So that's for the tiny 412. And then uh, the uh, other example for the button I have is uh, this is doing it with the SAMD11, which is the lowest end processor we use that uh, has native USB support. And so here, I'm using the Arduino library, uh, and again, just with uh, pin mode and digital read. And then I do an example here of uh, uh, talking directly to the pin hardware, which again is faster than the Arduino libraries. Now, one note about reading buttons, which sounds simple. Uh, when you close a button, it doesn't do that cleanly. Uh, it actually rattles a little bit and, and then settles. And this is on the order of microseconds. But remember, our processors are running much faster than that. And so they can easily read this as multiple opening and closing events. So uh, debouncing is uh, dealing with that. And one of the simplest ways to debounce is just once you read a button, don't read it again right away. Wait a little while for the button to, to finish uh, rattling. OK, next is magnetic fields. Uh, this is a sensor that measures the strength of a magnetic field in one direction, in one axis. And so uh, with that, if we do this version, um, I bring it in. It reads the magnetic field strength. If I turn it upside down, the sign changes, so it goes the other way. And then this is so sensitive that if I take it away, uh, let's see, that's 419.2, and now it's 418.2. I'm actually measuring the strength of Earth's magnetic field. So. In this example, I've got the Hall sensor. It puts out a voltage. I'm taking that into a pin, and I'm reading the voltage. And I've got multiple versions of that. So this version uh, uses the Arduino analog read. However, the ADC can do much more than that. And so this version. Uh, is going through the setup. All this comes from the data sheet, but here I'm picking which input, I'm picking what reference, I'm picking the gain, and I'm picking the number of samples. And so all of that lets me, at much finer control, trade off the performance of the ADC. And then here I tell it to convert, and then I, I'm waiting for it to finish converting and I get the reading. Um, so that's with the Tiny 412. Here's a version with the SAMD. And again, this just uses Arduino analog read. And um, 
uh, let's see, this version uh, is using, uh, there's a little bit more to do on the ARM processor, but this is talking directly to the configuration to set it up. It's a little messier talking to the hardware, but again, it's higher performance and gives you more options. And so if you, um, once you start pushing the performance, you'll care about that. Uh, then here's a really handy part. Uh, this is a vector magnetometer. It looks similar, but instead of measuring one axis, it measures the magnetic field in three different axes. And then this one is digital. So it speaks over I2C. We'll talk about more of that in networking week. I2C has two pins, SDA and SEL. Um, those pins get a pull-up resistor and then they go to two processor pins, and then you speak I2C to it. And so uh, for this one, uh, I've got an example where here I'm talking to it with the Arduino I2C library. And then uh, I2C is very simple uh, protocol. And so here, here's a little bit of code where I'm implementing I2C in software. And what's convenient about that is you can do it on any pin with any processor. So what this does is um, uh, in the image, this is a serial converter. This is the programmer. Uh, I'm going to load the code. And then once the code is loaded, I'm measuring uh, x, y, z. So let's see, I'm going to reload the code. I'm showing, the, I'm showing the code both from C and from Arduino. So once the code is loading, uh, as I move the magnet up and down, it's varying the field strength. And as I move it left, right, it's varying the position. And so there's all sorts of use cases for this. You can tell like when an axis gets to the end of its travel, you can tell when a lid closes. With a vector magnetometer, these get used, for example, in a joystick. You can have a magnet, uh, a joystick move a magnet and, and measure the position from it. Um, you can use it in an encoder to measure rotation. Uh, so all sorts of interface uses for magnetic field. Uh, potentiometer is a variable resistor. And so, for example, on this board, I've got a potentiometer, and I'm using that just to set a threshold voltage that tells the stepper uh, how much power to put out. Uh, step response. This is far and away my favorite sensor. So with this simple sensor, you can measure resistance, capacitance, inductance, position, pressure, tilt, acceleration, humidity, proximity. Uh, these, here's an example from homework in the class using step response to make a touchpad. Uh, here's an example to make a multi-touch pad that can measure more than one touch at once. Uh, this is an example from uh, Adrian where, let's see, he makes a force sensor So he's making a sandwich with two electrodes. And then um, when he compresses it, that's a force sensor. Um, here's a, a research paper on using the same sort of measurement to make a bend sensor um, with a pattern of electrodes that slides. And all of this is done with an incredibly simple uh, measurement. So what's happening is um, and there's two versions, uh, loading and transmit receive. So in the loading version, there's a large resistor, say one meg, goes to an electrode. And that's an output, but we're going to listen here as an input to the ADC. And then you're out here, and then there's, there's ground in the room. So when you come in the vicinity, uh, an electric field can go into you and out of you into the room. And so uh, if you look at what we're putting out here, we're putting out steps like that. 
but if you look here, um, what you see is it charges up and then it charges down. And the rate it does this depends on what's out here. Uh, so that's loading. That does depend on the room for the ground return. So generally, it's better to do this. So here's a transmitting electrode. Here's a receiving electrode. There's a pull-up resistor and a pull-down resistor. And again, these are large, given that we're measuring small, small capacitances. And then you read this into the ADC. So now there's an electric field here. And when something comes into the electric field, if we look at the signal we're putting out, that's steps like that. And if we look at the response, what you do is you get a charging pulse like that. And then what's in this charging pulse depends on what's in the field here. And so with that, um, here's an example of I've got to start, I've got two electrodes there, and then this is the charging signal between them. Um, when my hand comes in, it's sensing the proximity because I'm coupling the field between the electrodes. Now watch, I'm going to bring in a pad of paper and you'll see the value jumps up. The reason it just jumped up is I've got those uh, two electrodes when I bring in the pad of paper, it has a dielectric constant, which means the electric field prefers to be in here and it increases the coupling. So when I bring in the pad of paper, it senses the proximity of the material in the field. And then it can still sense through that to sense uh, uh, my proximity with the field leaking through the pad. And in fact, the sensitivity depends on position. And so it's actually giving me lateral information. And all of that is done with essentially nothing. Um, if we look at that example, uh, all I have on the board is I've got these, um, this, uh, a pin to charge and I've got on the receiver these two resistors. And so you can measure distance between those electrodes down to micron resolution. If you put them around a tube and you have a liquid, you can see when the liquid gets in the tube for tilt. If you put it on the side of a container as the liquid fills, you can measure the liquid level. If you me me the measure it um, sensitively, you can see the difference in air uh, from humidity. Um, if you put this on a mechanical structure, you can make a load cell that measures uh, forces uh, are all measurements you can do with it. And there's really only one subtlety, which is uh, if we look at the code, you'll see I, I have number of samples and up and down. And what I'm doing is this, this is a fairly low level measurement. So I'm, I'm measuring it multiple times and I'm averaging it to improve my signal to noise. And then the other thing is if there's background electric fields, they'll change the readings, but they vary more slowly than what we're doing typically. So rather than measuring the absolute signal, what I'm doing is I'm me measuring the difference between the up signal and the down signal. And that helps me subtract out the external electric fields. And so what's particularly great about this is you can build all sorts of user interfaces with it. So you can, if you put it underneath a case, you can make a button where nothing mechanically goes through the case. If you put some foam, you can make a force sensitive button. Um, if you make a uh, wedges that, that are shaped and you rotate them relative to each other, you can measure angle. Um, almost anything, um, uh, let's see, uh, Jason, you're asking about the difference. It's, it's just, let's see, I'm, I'm measuring relative rather than absolute signals, uh, if that's what you're asking, by, by measuring up versus down. 
is a common technique to measure change in signals, not absolute signals. Um, and then uh, these links show at higher frequencies, you can actually learn about the composition of materials. You can actually pull out chemistry information. Uh, so um, uh, let's see, uh, Adrian is linking uh, step response. Um, uh, let me add a note for that. Uh, uh, this is doing step response with a shower. Uh, and so, Again, th th this turns all sorts of sensing and input problems just into arts and crafts uh, using step response. And so if you're not sure what to do, uh, do this. This is the most versatile, easy, flexible, uh, fun kind of sensor for this week. Okay, that's step response. Next one is temperature. So this is a temperature sensor. I'm going to heat it up and then it's going to cool off. Uh, that's using a resistor whose resistance depends on uh, temperature. And the subtlety here is it's only going to change by a few percent. So we could take the variable resistor, um, put it in a divider, and read it like that. But if you look at the ADC range, it would move just a little bit in the middle of the range. Instead, what we do is we make four resistors like that. And one of these is our variable one. And the other ones nominally are the same value, but those are fixed ones. Then here, I'm going to go into a differential amplifier. It measures the difference between two voltages. So when these all match, the signal this way and the signal that way are the same. But when the resistance change, they get unbalanced. But now what's happening is when they're matched, the signal is zero. And so we're using the whole ADC range rather than the small range uh, to digitize it. So we get much more sensitivity. So this is called a bridge. And the underlying principle is you want to measure small changes in small signals, not small changes in big signals. And so uh, what's on the circuit is the four resistors to make the bridge. And we're going into two pins on the ADC. And then if you look at the code, um, I'm setting up the ADC to tell it I want uh, an amplified version of the difference between two pins. So I've got to tell it to make a differential measurement. Um, uh, so that's temperature measurement. Then for light measurement, here's a uh, optical sensor. And so it's measuring the shadow of my finger. And what's happening here is uh, I'm using a photo a uh, transistor. So light comes in. Um, uh, the um, uh, to the photo transistor uh, that sets the current that can go through it. Um, and then I can I can put a resistor on either side. Um, and then what happens is uh, can either do it this way or this way. Uh, the light sets the current going through here. And then the current you pull through here changes the voltage here. And we digitize that. And so uh, on here, I've got the um, photo transistor. And then I've got the pull up resistor. And I go into an ADC pin. And then you can get these photo transistors um, this is one that has a screen, so it only sees infrared light. This is one that sees visible light. <clears throat> you might see mentions to uh, light sensing resistors. Those are obsolete. These photo transistors uh, have gain, and so they're more sensitive. And you can set the gain by the value of the resistor. Then 
from there, this is synchronous detection, which is a really powerful technique. So uh, here, the light is always on, but you'll see this bar graph shooting up when I come near it. So what I'm doing there is uh, an important technique. On that board, I've got an LED uh, sending out light. Um, then I've got my photo detector uh, measuring light coming in. And then light is going to bounce off my finger to here. But the problem is, if I just do that, and I look at the signal here, the signal here is going to be varying all over the place based on the all of the light coming in from the room, based on the room lights or the weather or whatever else. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm taking the light coming out and I'm turning that on and off. This is similar to what I was doing in the step response. I'm turning it on and off. And so now if I look at the photo detector, um, what I see is there's the slowly varying background from all the light in the room, but on top of it, there are these little steps. And these little steps come from turning this light on and off. And so what I do is I ignore the, the absolute signal but what I do is I measure the difference between when the light is on and off, and I average that many times. And that's separating just the light that went from here to here from all the other sources of the light. Uh, so on that board, we have uh, the two devices, the phototransistor and the LED. Um, and then in the code, what I do is I turn on the L I turn off the LED, I read, I turn on the LED, read, and I average that many times. And that's what I send out. And then so again, this is show the signal for when the LED was on. This is the signal LED off. They're very similar, but they're slightly different. And then this is showing the difference between them. And so this is, uh, if you, for example, wanted to measure uh, people passing a turnstile, um, you can have the LED on one side and the photo detector on the other side, and it'll only measure the light going through here that a person might block, and it'll ignore the light that comes from anywhere else. So that's synchronous detection. Then here's a handy uh, device. Uh, this looks a bit like a phototransistor, but this one measures color. So I'm measuring uh, the color of the reflected light. And so here that is. And again, this is an I2C device. So uh, I2C devices have these two pins, SCL and SDA. And we'll talk more about that again in networking week. And then I've got the two pull-up resistors going into the processor to measure color. Okay. Next comes motion. So a common way to do that is this is uh, this is uh, used often in uh, building occupant detection. This is measuring your body makes radiation because of you're alive. Your temperature makes infrared light, literally, and and this uh, measures that. Um, however, this is a newer way to do it. That's much uh, much more sensitive. Uh, this is called a radar, but it's not really a radar. What this does is it sends out a microwave signal, and then uh, it mixes a signal that's reflected back. And if nothing is moving, uh, they're at the same frequency. But if, if something is moving, 
there's a Doppler shift. So when a train goes by and you hear the pitch change, that's because the frequency changes with the uh, motion. And here, when something is moving, there's a change in the frequency of the scattered signal. And by mixing those two, it's a very simple circuit, but by mixing those together, it gets a motion signal. So this isn't measuring distance, it's measuring motion. Uh, and so here, you just have a logic interface. You, you, you put out a signal to it and it gives you a signal back. And so I've just got that attached to the board. And then um, this is it down at the bottom there. And then this is me sneaking up. And then it's just reporting when it sees motion. And then if I stay still, it stops. And then if I move, it triggers. And this can see uh, quite a few meters away. So this doesn't tell you the distance to me but it tells you if there's activity in the proximity. So that's a motion sensor. Then this is a really handy part. So to measure distance, a common way that used to be done is with these devices. <clears throat> these are uh, sonar. They put out a high frequency sound and they listen for it to come back. Um, uh, but now, the preferred way to do it is with this part. And this is an incredible part. So uh, this device that's a few dollars in quantity, it um, measures light propagation. So uh, these are two generations of it. So light travels quickly. It's a nanosecond per foot. What this part is doing that's incredible is it's measuring how long it takes for light to go and come back. So the, if we go to the sonar version, um, this is doing it with sound. So it's measuring the time for the sound to go and come back. And it works well if there's a good reflecting surface, but there's a limit to how far it can see. And in addition, if it's not a good sound reflector, you don't get a signal back. And, and an example is if I just rotate this slightly, um, it doesn't see the sound anymore. So with this time of flight sensor, um, I'm going to uh, load the code. So now once I've got the code loaded, right now I'm measuring the distance down to the table, but now I'm gonna turn it up and now I'm measuring the distance up to the roof. And so it can measure better than a millimeter, but it can measure out to multiple meters. Um, that's, and then let's see, that's doing the same thing now with a module. And so again, I'm measuring to millimeters, um, but I can turn it around and I can point it up and I can measure out to meters, but measuring with a resolution of millimeters. And it, it's uh, very robust. All you need is some light to come back. Um, uh, the uh, field of vision is in the data sheet. It gives an, an optical divergence angle. I don't recall what that is. Now, the one note on this is uh, this is a fairly small part. And so if you want to make it yourself, um, you have to do reflow. So uh, uh, here I am. I'm making little dots of paste. Um, I've shown before for reflow, if you make a continuous bead and heat it, it moves to the pads. But in this case, uh, because they're all underneath and they're fairly small, here I'm just making little dots of paste. Um, I put the part down, I then bring in the hot air, and um, 
if the hot air is much too fast, you'll actually just uh, blow the part away. Uh, but if you uh, tune it right, um, when you see this, you should be happy. What you see here is the, the solder pushing out from under the pads where I did the soldering. And that tells you I made a nice uh, joint. Um, so that's reflow. The, if we go back to this, the part itself in um, quantity cost a few dollars. You can get a module if you don't want to have to do that. Uh, but this module is uh, $19 instead of a few dollars. And it basically does the same thing. So you can bypass the reflow by buying the module, but better le to learn to do the reflow. Uh, so that's optical time of flight. And that's a, a great way to measure absolute distance. Then this is a GPS receiver. The cost of these has come way down. Uh, these used to cost much more. And so here, this is very simple. I just have a serial interface going to the GPS receiver. Uh, um, what I'm doing here is a, a, a trick. The, the receiver has pins designed to go through, through hole mounting. But what you can do is if you make pads and you tin the pads, you can flow solder and mount it as if it's a surface mount device. Uh, then it's just a serial interface. So here I'm using, th there are lots of different libraries to talk to these. In this case, I'm just simply doing my own serial communication. And here's what it does. So I, I, I turn it on, and then it's telling me no fix, no fix, no fix. Now it has the fix, and then it says four, five, seven, eight satellites. So uh, the first time you turn it on, it takes a while for it to find the satellites. But once it's done, it remembers where it thinks you are, and that helps it get started. And so. Uh, this antenna is sensitive enough to get a signal coming from a satellite in orbit, and it's telling you your position, but in addition, the satellites have atomic clocks to tell time. That's how it, it measures position by the satellite tells you what time it thinks it is, but there's a time delay for the signal to reach you, and by comparing those, it gets the position. Um, and then... Um, the uh, it gives you the time of day, and that's using these these nanosecond accurate clocks. So assuming you can see the sky, you can get position, um, but you can also um, uh, get time of day uh, to uh, absolute precision. Um, th the accuracy of GPS it depends on a bunch of things. Uh, it depends, uh, you can average to reduce the noise and then differential GPS uses local references, but um, uh, state of the art gets down to below millimeters. Um, meters is easy, centimeters maybe if you do averaging. Um, and yeah, there's a note, uh, there, there's sensitivity about um, spreading of the GPS given the military. There's a, there's a complex history to the use of spreading signals in it. So that's a GPS. Uh, next is, this is uh, an accelerometer that gives you X, Y, and Z motion. And so that's using a, uh, this part is a, um, I'll have to, I'll check that link. Um, that's a three axis accelerometer. Typically all of these come in small packages. Um, here I'm doing an alternative to PACE. This is another way to do reflow. Uh, here what I did is I put little solder bumps on the pads underneath and then I heat it up and I, I bring it down. And then, um, Uh, this again speaks I2C, so I've got SEL, SDA, and the two resistors, and I get the data from it. Then beyond that, uh, this is a module that has, ooh, I don't know what's going on with um, those. Um, 
this module has six degrees of freedom. It has three is the accelerometer, which measures X, Y, Z translation. And then three is a gyroscope that measures X, Y, Z rotation. And then uh, this one has nine. And what that's doing is uh, three translation, three rotation, and it's got three magnetic fields. And so the reason you do that, so the raw signals are, it measures X, Y, Z acceleration. It measures X, Y, Z rotation. And then it measures the magnetic field in three different axes. And the reason it's doing that is to get from acceleration and rotation to position, you have to integrate, you have to add up the signal and that drifts over time, but the Earth's magnetic field doesn't drift over these time scales. And so you use the magnetic field to, to remove drift from the other sensors. And so in turn, AHRS is the problem of using this data and figuring out your orientation. Um, let's see, the, um, let's see, I wanna find a demo of the AHRS. Um, yeah, this is what I'm looking for. And so uh, with that, you can do this. So an AHRS library takes translation and rotation, adds it up and gives you absolute orientation. Um, you only need six degrees of freedom to do that. But if you want it to be stable for a long time, you need the nine degrees of freedom. And then the note here is uh, these parts. And again, uh, I don't know why I'll have to fix all of these links. Digiki must have moved uh, the site. Uh, uh, these parts are very small. Their uh, most common use is in cell phones where space, space is very tight. So the, these ones, the laser time of flight is pretty straightforward to do the reflow in your lab. These are really right at the edge of the reflow you can do in the lab, the smallest of these parts. Um, let's see, I'm gonna mute everyone. Somebody's making noise. So these are accelerometers to give you translation and rotation. So uh, a common use for them is to measure orientation of an object. You can also um, sense interactions. Um, uh, there was an example in the machine building of sensing when a spindle starts moving, or you can sense, for example, on furniture when somebody uh, interacts with it. So that's acceleration and rotation. Um, next is audio. So. So uh, this board is recording the sound. And you know, with enough resolution to resolve the waveform. So once upon a time, that was done with electrets, which is just the raw transducer. And then we would, you'd have to add an amplifier to talk to them. But yeah, DigiKeys moved a lot of stuff around. Uh, more recently, we would use, boy. Um, wow. Um, uh, the um, DigiKey must have done a, a major site overhaul um, uh, since I did this. Uh, the, let me take this much. So I'll go back through um, after class and fix all of these. Oh, you know what? No, it's not, DigiKey's broken. Sorry, it's not a lot of bad links. Nothing's working. DigiKey site is broken. <laughs> okay, so, uh, that's not for me to fix. That, that's unusual. It's for DigiKey to fix. So what's going on here is uh, this part, which again needs reflow. 
is a microphone. It's the transducer. After the transducer is the analog uh, signal conditioning. And then after that, it's an I2S interface. So these are the, um, if we look at the board, um, uh, this is the digital microphone. And then it's got the um, uh, logic interfaces. Now, this is using what's called I2S. I2S is similar to I2C, um, which is a common interface to talk to uh, devices, but this one is specific for audio. So it's a synchronous interface. What that means is you put out a waveform and that's a clock and then it, it sends in the signals to you. So I2S, is a protocol for digital communication to audio devices. And so both speakers and microphones speak I2S. Now, in the example I'm showing here, I'm doing something somewhat unusual, which is bigger processors have I2S built into them. In this example, I'm using a small processor, uh, in this case, the tiny 1614, that doesn't have I2S in hardware. But the processor is so fast, you can do I2S uh, purely in software. So um, this long looking routine, what I'm doing is I'm ticking out the clock signal. And then I'm reading in the data coming back. Now, the reason this looks like this is all of this could be in a loop. But when you make a loop in software, it takes more time to go through the loop and the time can vary. So this is what's called an unrolled loop. The audio signal is 32 bits long. And so instead of making the loop, I've unrolled the loop and now the timing is predictable and it's faster. And so uh, what this is lets me do is, uh, purely in software read an I2S signal. And then the code down here is pretty simple. What I'm doing is I read in the signal, I save it in a buffer, and then I ship that audio buffer out. So it's more typical to use a processor that has hardware I2S and then use an I2S library. But this shows you can actually do I2S um, uh, directly in uh, software. Let's see, Steven put a link in. Um, no, so Steven, I think this is a regional server issue that, that it, it, it's working for you, not me, given wh however DigiKey is serving. It. So hope, hope, hopefully that'll come up here. It may be working for you elsewhere. Okay, so uh, the MEMS device, again, this is one more device where you need to learn. Yeah, so it's working in other places. This must be um, the content distribution DigiKey is using. Uh, this is another part where you need to be able to do uh, reflow, but the digital microphone makes it so much easier. Back in the old days, we had to make, um, uh, here's a, an amplifier to make all of the signal conditioning. And so that lets you read audio. And there's a lot you can do with that. You can crudely just say, is there sound? Uh, you can make filters that measure sounds at different frequencies. You can find simple patterns in the sound. Another thing you can do is by measuring, uh, the speed of sound is fairly slow. By measuring the speed of arrival of sound at more than one location, you can uh, locate where the sound source is. Uh, sorry, J Jason's asking about tube amps. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, let's see, I'm not sure why you're asking. Oh, you're asking, yeah, just for audio. So um, tube amplifiers, you can spend insane amounts of money on audio file. This is just, this is an $8,000 tube amplifier for your headphones. Um, audiophiles are religious about the performance of tubes. Um, I, I end up much more biased by if you, uh, 
look at the performance of the tube in the resolution of the voltage in the sampling rate, you can match the performance of the tube in the physics. And really what you're hearing isn't the absolute performance, it's the filtering, it, it's, it's shaping the frequency response. And so there are audiophiles who would disagree with me, but if you look at the basic physics, you can match that performance. And it's really preference in um, uh, shaping you know, in the filter design, uh, but it's a very sensitive thing. Um, uh, okay. Oh, let's see. Stephen is noting you might have to pick a country. Um, uh, yeah. So again, Ulu noise is more more comfortable. Again, uh, you can easily make bad digital designs where where it's intrusive, but you can design filters around that. So if you just look at the raw signals, you can match it at the signal level. But uh, th this is this is a religious debate that. Uh, I, I, do, I don't want to go near people who feel strongly about tubes. Um, that, that's just my personal opinion. Um, let's see, Hank, you're, what's the beware of them? What's the concern, Hank? No, there was in the chat that was mentioning of these uh, cheap time of flight uh, sensors. They only measure, uh, what was it? Only a few centimeters. Well, but let's see, the 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 um VL family sensors are are okay. The the ones I linked are good to um, millimeters. Yeah. Okay. Um okay, a few more sensors remaining time. So uh Piezos are disks that make a voltage when they flex. A common use for them is if you attach that to an object, you can sense um, vibrations traveling through the objects. Um, you can get force sensing resistors, but these measure force as resistance, but they're, it's, it's fairly nonlinear, hysteretic. Um, uh, it has a, a lot of uh, funny properties. Um, strain gauges measure resistance and you put them on objects and measure flexing. Um, load cells take strain gauges and put them in objects that measure loads on objects. But you can do all of that with capacitance. So this is a commercial uh, capacitance uh, force sensor. But Adrian showed his example of making, uh, you can make one of these just with two electrodes and an elastomer and measuring um, step response. Uh, angle, commonly you can do it with rotary encoders that measure angle. Um, this is a link to a pressure sensor. Uh, this is a link to infrared reflection that you can use to measure pulses. This is a link to a dust sensor uh, for air pollution. Uh, these are a, a sort of in quotes gas sensors. There, there are many different sensors in, the, in these families. They don't they're the, uh, resistance materials that are functionalized and they respond to a range of signals. So it's better to view those as like a fingerprint. You can get ones targeting different gases, but if you get a, a, a couple of them and just apply whatever you want to measure and look at the fingerprint that comes from it, um, uh, they overlap. And then the last thing I'm going to spend time on is image. So the ESP32 CAM has significantly simplified getting image data in. Um, so these are about $10 each. Um, it's an ESP32 with a camera. And it's a few megapixel camera. And so uh, uh, in this example, uh, there's almost nothing on, on my board. All I did is make a header uh, to plug in that board. And I have the, um, remember for ESP32s, you need this mode switch for programming. And so uh, with that, uh, Espressif has a library uh, for their cameras, the people who make that. And so my first example is using that library. So I'm going to load 
I'm going to add their uh, code source. Then I'm going to add their, use their demonstration code. Then uh, in their code, I'm picking the camera. Um, then it wants to know I'm going to talk to it over Wi-Fi. So I load the code. I reset it. Uh, and then once that's running, uh, it, it wakes up, it tells me it's the address it's serving at. I'm going to go to its address. And now this is an app being served by the ESP32. It's exposing all the controls on the camera. And so up top is my desktop computer, but below is the image coming back from the ESP32 cam. Uh, and then in no, this example, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to mute all, unmute if you need to talk. In this example, this is code I wrote to demonstrate as uh, image processing. So once I start this running, uh, below is an image, um, then I'm inverting, I'm half toning, here I'm motion detecting. I'm doing lots of different examples of real time image processing. Uh, in the ESP32. And so to do that, uh, in this is the code running the ESP32. I get in the image, I turn it into a data buffer, and then I've got these different routines that um, uh, invert it, threshold it. Uh, this is where I motion detect. And then I send that out through the web stream. And so all of that lets you for about $10 do powerful image processing. Uh, these are links to more advanced image processing libraries uh, that need bigger processors. But there's a lot of image processing of detecting things like tokens, patterns, um, motion you can do just with the ESP32 cam. Uh, so that's image processing. Um, and actually, yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the chat. I should mention that there's still more comments in the chat about tubes, digital versus analog. Digital versus analog is a huge battle that I, I, I don't want to suggest an answer to. But just as background for my interest in that question, um, let me see. Um, uh, many years ago, with a composer at MIT, um, We did a project to put uh, sensors on a cello with Yo-Yo Ma. And um, that was related to this question about tube amplifiers. I was interested in the physics of musical instruments and looking at, I can sense as fast as a Stradivarius does. And so can I make something to compete with a Stradivarius? And Yo-Yo really, you know, he was very unsentimental about the instrument. He just cared about the performance of it. Uh, and appreciated um, uh, the the response of that. Uh, just, just as background of thinking about my, my interest in this question about what are sort of the fundamental limits of the performance of musical instruments. OK, so with that rapid fire tour, it really is just a survey. You'll have to uh, descend into um, more detail. The group is 
help with debugging. So look at raw sensor signals on a scope, uh, use a logic analyzer, look at protocol, look at what's coming back from these, and individually pick a sensor and read it. You could um, uh, make a new board just for this purpose, or you could take a board you've made before and make a sensor to it, uh, but get a signal in. And it could be any of these sensors. If you're not sure, play with step response, my favorite one. But also keep an eye. We need to start counting down to the final project. So think about the sensing you're going to need in the uh, final projects. And uh, Adrian is pointing out that in his Adrian Nino collection, uh, he has. Um, I think everything I described, he has linked on this page as examples of these with Shao's. Okay, that's let's see, looking at the chat. That's input devices. And then once again, we do have a recitation Monday, and that's going to be a tour of what's the annual meeting we're doing in Bhutan, what is the FAB Foundation, what are the, um, the program of cities, what's the portal for the network. All of those uh, ecosystem programs we'll cover on Monday. Okay, final questions or comments? Uh, if not, this should be a fun week. Once you get over just the basics of the PIN interface, the ADC, the I2C, there's a whole universe of sensing you can do. <laughs> Let's see, J Jason asks, are there any religious debates I do want to um, throw out there? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that question for now. I'll think about it, but I'll pass on that question for now. Okay, happy sensing. Uh, as always, we're back to the uh, team for Saturday open time and then Monday recitation and see you for uh, your input devices on Wednesday. And then we have a fun week. Instead of 3D printing, we're going to make molds and casts. Uh, <laughs> And J Jason is signing off as a VI loyalist. Uh, it, he is right. In that case, I, I, um, I live in VI. Almost anything you see from me at some point passes through VI. OK, bye bye. Bye bye. Look at me. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.